I, but I have to say on Facebook, um, I continually get message requests or I want to be your friends from attractive young women who, well, I assume they're attractive because they send their photo, which seems either not to be them. But I have this image whenever I see them of this rather fat Indian man sitting in deepest, darkest, or I don't know, Mumbai, sending off these to a whole series of white, single, what they regard as single Western men, hoping that they'll eventually find someone. Mm. It's not an image that particularly inspires me, I've got to say. All right, now, um, but somebody who isn't in that particular form of uh, abyss joins us now, our usual um, economic and political and financial commentator, one of New Zealand's leading businessmen and the Tomata of Otago University's Business School, Craig Stobo, joins us now. Craig, do you get many scams at all coming your way? No, my social media... Uh uh, apps uh, confined to LinkedIn, so I'm not on any other social media. So unless you send me a letter or knock on my door, probably pretty rare, Michael. Oh, okay. So you've never been tempted to go on Facebook? No, not at all. No, I, uh, I'm one of a growing number in our age group who are uh, using Facebook, uh, which has been rejected by younger people in favour of uh, TikTok and Instagram, yeah. uh, but uh, you'll find, as I said before in previous uh, <coughs> meetings and interviews with you, that we tend to use WhatsApp as a group. We set up WhatsApp group chat uh, forums for our friends or our colleagues, and it's a, a group that's approved internally, and we can get stuff done rather than having to go and, and, and talk to the world through Facebook. Mm, okay, fair enough. Um, mm, all right. Um, Craig, um, today the government announced uh, at 9.30 this morning what they hope will be big changes to the building sector or at least make it easier for people to build and buy a house in this country without going through. Um, a whole series of what seem labyrinthian uh, bureaucracies um, and costs to get there. One of the things that struck me and uh, one of the things uh, I think Building Minister Chris Pink said today was that it costs 50% more to build a house in New Zealand than it does in Australia. Does that sound credible to you? Uh, I haven't seen the uh, information that came out this morning and I can't verify 50%, but housing costs are certainly more, more costly here than in Australia. And that's driven by a number of things. One is uh, the cost of building materials here, the cost of consents, um, the relative <coughs> cost of our labour and, and scale um, you know, we we have had in the past the focus on building individual houses rather than building, you know, suites of terraces or apartments, uh, which obviously is changing with the cost of land. But now Australia is much cheaper to build than New Zealand. Mm. Um, now, there's a whole lot of civil servants who are losing their jobs at the moment and they're screaming about it. Radio New Zealand have even set up a helpline for them, believe it or not, so that you can, if you're losing your job, they want to hear from you. So you can imagine how that's going to play in the next wee while. Um, I have read in the New Zealand Herald this morning, and a good piece of work done there by their journalists, that towards the end of last year, large numbers of government departments actually recruited personnel um, and the suggestion is it was a cynical ploy to ensure that they, when they have to get rid of them, um, they won't actually cut much into the organisation on the last in, first off principle. Does that strike you as being something that senior public servants would do? Oh, I, I found that information... Uh, unreal. It, it has 2,000 extra hires in the December quarter from memory. Yeah. Remember the election was the, the election was the October and it may well that some of those hires were done before the election but I do know of government departments that after the election result was known, which of course was later in the month, uh, they held meetings around, right, the winds change, uh, there's, there'll be a different focus from this government, let's just stop. But theoretically, there's been a bipartisan agreement amongst uh, opposition and, and governments that policy work kind of stops about three months out from an election mm. because you don't know who's coming in. Mm. 
Mm. So it's just incredible if within six weeks of the beginning of the September quarter, that many uh, public servants were hired, which sort of puts a, you know, it puts a wry smile on my face when you think about people that are complaining about reductions in public servants uh, that have been called for in the last you know, eight weeks, uh, but that comes off an, an even higher base. Yeah, so the, the theory goes like this for people who haven't um, caught up with the story this morning. There are roughly 15,000, 16,000 public servants hired after 2017, between 2017 and 2023. Um, so that's the a swelling of the public sector by almost 25% in terms of numbers. In the last quarter of last year, as Craig's just alluded to there, um, the Public Service Commission have just published that an additional as Craig's just said, roughly 2,000 hires were made by government departments. And the extraordinary thing about that, of course, as the New Zealand Herald notes, and Craig has just noted now, is that they were made against a background of a change of government, but also, Craig, even Labor had said they were looking for cuts within government departments as well. So, again, it seems to defy credulity that public servant heads in Wellington would say, quick, let's go and hire as many people as we can. Yeah, and also which departments uh, were hiring, you know, so you sort of have to have a look at the at the rationale of those chief executives in those departments, knowing what was pretty clear in the, in the December quarter that, you know, if, if at, the very, at the very least there was... Um, a, uh, a chance that the, the government might change, you'd think they'd put a hiring freeze on. So I, I would like to know why hires were made and under what, under what pressures were those decisions made? Were they hires to fill vacancies that had been vacant for 12 months, for example, or are they additional hires that were uh, put in place on top of an existing headcount? Uh, I, can, I can give you the answer to that question. Uh, they were additional. So the, the right. total number, Craig, was 2,580. That's 2,500. And they were in addition to the equivalent, full-time equivalents within the public sector. Um, yeah, to add well, to that, and, and, and across 31 of the New Zealand's 38 departments and agencies expanded their numbers of staff between September and December of last year. Well, if you if you're in a if you're in a business, uh, you'd say to uh, customers, as a result of all of this, are you getting a better service? Are you getting better pricing? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you cannot at all justify those changes given the service quality and uh, performance of our public service. Um, so I, I just think that uh, uh, would make the Minister of Finance um, see red around the job that she's got. Um, the greatest increases uh, in numbers were the Ministry of Social Development, the Ministry or MB, Minister for Business Innovation and Employment, which is just, God, it's just the New Zealand Post, it's the New Zealand Railways, isn't it, of the 21st century, MB, um, the IRD, but the greatest, this will interest you, Craig, the greatest percentage increase, 22% increase in staff numbers was the Ministry for the Environment. Yeah, well, yeah, that's uh, that says a lot about throwing resources at presumably uh, climate change issues. I, I don't, I don't know why, but that sort of brings me on to another, another topic if I can. Michael, Go for your life. Yep. Nice, nice fifty point. I'm at the um, an offsite in uh, Millbrook, uh, looking out over a carpeted orange and red and yellow landscape on the Arrowtown Hills with the New Zealand Initiative uh, annual offsite, and uh, we started this morning. But what you've just alluded to is, is kind of helpful for what I wanted to say as, a, as an introduction to other discussion. Um, it's been pu well publicised, uh, but one of the concerns we have is a, a structural deficit um, between revenue and expenses. We spoke a little bit about that last week with the budget policy statement, but what the initiative uh, is published is that our structural deficit, which was zero in 2017, is now 5.5% of GDP. In other words, that number doesn't really move very well. It moves a little bit with you know, strong growth and weak growth, but between those two points, 
we've got this deficit of 5.5% of GDP in 2023, which is the second worst in the US and in, in the OECD behind the US. And so Nicola's not got just to cope with a weaker economy, but the cuts that she's got to consider or program changes are greater um, than was um, considered uh, in, 20, in 2017. So we've got ourselves in a real pickle where we've got to make quite much larger changes than possibly has been envisaged in this budget. And the second one, which goes to the comment you made around civil servants or state servants, is the bureaucracy, the, gov- the machinery of government. Um, the, the initiatives uh, published a really good report on um, the impossibility of our ministers managing their portfolios. And just by way of example, that it, we've got 12 sectors in the economy, agriculture or transport or um, uh, pick another subject, electricity, for example. And then we have a range of government departments that try and manage or look after or preside or regulate those sectors. And, and within um, each government department, there are several um, several components that create portfolios for ministers. To cut a long story short, to use MB as an example, which you were discussing before, that has 17 different portfolios that are responsible uh, are the responsibility of a wide range of different ministers. And if you have a minister with five or six portfolios and MB has to report to, say, seven ministers, it's a very clunky mach- piece of machinery of government. And I don't know how I don't know how ministers can possibly manage chunky portfolios like that efficiently without having to rely completely on official advice. And eventually you get swamped because you've got too much on your plate. So there are two two things that came coming out this morning so far. One is the, the structural deficit we have, uh, which needs to be changed if we get back to a more flexible economy. And secondly, the machinery of government is not working for us. It's too difficult for officials and ministers to work on these substantial issues when the system is just completely overloaded. Now, just to explain to people that are listening to this, you're at a members retreat for the New Zealand Initiative in Queenstown. Um, yeah. Can anybody be a member of the New Zealand Initiative? Uh, they, they can in the sense that it's a, <coughs> it's a, cor- a corporate membership-based organisation. Right. Generally, businesses uh, are members. There's a few private members, but generally speaking, it's it's businesses from transport to electricity to retail, a uh, wide range of of groups, but not just uh, businesses. There are non-government organisations who are members as well uh, from the charitable sector. And it's a source of ideas. It's a different way of thinking. So people will come not necessarily agreeing uh, with uh, the initiative's research, but they like the consistency of ideas that that throws out as challenges to the way we govern or manage um, parts of our economy or, or parts of our society. And I certainly find it really refreshing. It stimulates me, that's for sure. 